Have you ever eaten a frozen meal, canned soup, or a bag of chips before? Then you've probably consumed the ruptured, concentrated remains of single-celled yeast. This tasty, savory, and protein-rich black tar is what we'll be making today. Welcome to DIY Biotech. We usually think of our food as either coming from animals or plants, maybe sometimes fungi, but we can also safely consume some other types of microorganisms. Yeast in particular have been selectively bred, no pun intended, for centuries for making bread or alcohol. Humans have consumed these Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast mostly as a byproduct of their leavening of bread and of mood. Since the 1920s, yeast has been purposely consumed for its high B vitamin and protein content. All these little guys are, are delicious sacks of protein and nutrients. Additionally, yeast is easy to grow, can consume low cost materials like molasses, and is even a protein source of similar quality to whey. So today, I'll show you how to convert brown sugar into yeast extract. Shout out to Adam Ragusea for inspiring this video. First, we need to grow our yeast. Yeast like sugar, but they also need other elements as well. Like most life, they need schnapps. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Sugar is all carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, so that won't do alone. Brown sugar, on the other hand, is just white sugar plus molasses. Molasses contains plentiful trace nutrients that the yeast need to grow properly. So don't do this with plain sugar. The yeast we select here can also be important. Unfortunately, it isn't super easy to find a strain that's been bred for high protein production. Our choices here are limited to brewer's yeast or bread yeast. They're still both Saccharomyces, but one produces considerably more alcohol and the other does not. Today, I'm using a champagne yeast that just happens to be what I have lying around. So really, the only other component is water. Filter or distilled water is probably best. Here we go, let's put everything together. I'm using an old two liter soda bottle and giving a half-assed attempt at sterilization by pouring boiling sugar water inside and shaking it up. As a note, I used about 65 grams of brown sugar. Finally, I can add more filtered water and then my yeast. Now, don't underestimate the power of yeast. Even just overnight in a relatively cold house, this soda bottle was fully pressurized. Yeast tends to grow in a shape like this. Slow at first, the lag phase, and then very quickly, the exponential phase, until all the nutrients are consumed where a stationary phase is reached. During this exponential phase, the yeast will be breaking the glucose down into more yeast building blocks, but excreting CO2 as a waste product. This is the gas that's pressurizing the bottle. The pressurization of the bottle will give us a good indication of when the fermentation is done. Once the yeast stop producing CO2, they must have stopped consuming the glucose. For me, this took about five days. Here is the bottle of yeast after about five days of fermentation. It's uh, pretty tight. I've been burping it regularly several times a day. So let's open it up and give it a taste. Here we go. There's a little bit of bubbles. I burped it earlier, but it slowed down a bunch. Uh, I shook it about five minutes ago. It smells a little bit alcoholic, not sweet at all. Nice and bubbly. I'm not expecting this to be good. Mainly the thing that I want to find out is if there is alcohol in it and if there's sugar left in it, because really we want to get rid of all of the sugar during the fermentation and convert it into yeast. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Cheers. I mean, it's a little bit alcoholic. It sort of tastes like, um, it tastes like a seltzer, honestly, <laughs> which I guess this is how they make seltzers is just fermenting sugar water. I guess you got to have the yeast nutrients too, but Basically just fermented sugar water. This is unfiltered though. It's got live yeast in it, so you probably wouldn't want to drink a lot of it. It might have alcohol in it. It doesn't 
smell like it has a lot of alcohol in it. I'll save a sample of this and we'll test alcohol content in a minute. Remember in the beginning when I said yeast extract is the ruptured remains of yeast? Well, this is the time to do the rupturing. We have to split open the yeast cells to get to the tasty proteins and other compounds inside. As they say, there's a million ways to split a yeast, but today I think autolysis will be the easiest. Autolysis is the process of heating the yeast just enough to break open the cells, but not hot enough to denature the proteins. For this yeast, we want to aim for between 45 and 60 degrees Celsius and hold it at that temperature for one hour. The cells will split open and some enzymes may retain their ability to break down the unwanted cell debris. Now we can pour the contents back into our soda bottle and leave it in the fridge overnight. The next day, all the cell wall debris has sunk to the bottom, leaving proteins and salts in suspension. We can very gently pour off the supernatant, or what's on top, back into the pot to reduce it down. Now we can actually boil this. It took about an hour to reduce this down to a syrup. Here it is after it's been reduced down in the dehydrator for about 16 hours at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't solidify, it just stays this nasty goo. <laughs> and it smells, it smells very savory, like, like meaty. So I'm going to get a little bit on my fingy there <laughs> and we're going to taste it. Yeah, a little bit salty, a little bit savory. Tastes a tiny bit like beer and just a, a, a little bit bitter. If you've ever had Marmite before, it's this Australian British yeast extract. Basically the same product as this, but with spices and salt and other things like that in it. And this tastes and smells and looks really similar. So I think that's about what we've made here. So yeah, this is basically the same thing as Marmite. So, you know, you could make this if you want to and, and get basically a Marmite product. You just really don't get that much. Out of two entire liters of liquid, it looks like we only got a few milliliters of product. So where did all the mass of the sugar go? None of our product tasted sweet. And I mean, the sugar is a solid. It can't just evaporate. It must be converted to something else here. Before I break it down, comment below where you think the majority of the sugar is going and no cheating. Okay, so I hope you put your answers in the comments below because here it comes. We used 65 grams of light brown sugar, which is about three and a half percent molasses. That means about 63 grams of this is glucose. Glucose is the only carbon source that we really care about. At the end, we can add back this approximately two grams of molasses for our final uh, possible yield of yeast extract. The first thing that I did was measure the alcohol content and I found it to be about 2%. I used my alcohol content detector that I build for kombucha brewers. I've been selling these for about two years now just as a little side project. Uh, I first ran a calibration curve with known concentrations of alcohol content, did several dilutions to the fermented yeast media, and then measured them all in the detector, and they came about with the same approximate alcohol content of 2%. This was a really rough test, so I don't know if this was actually 1.9 or 2.1%, but I think 2% was a, a pretty close approximation of the alcohol content here. So we got a little bit of alcohol. The next thing we know is that CO2 is also produced from this glucose, and in fact, exactly one third of the carbon atoms from glucose go to carbon in carbon dioxide. This is just a product of the metabolic pathway that happens here. Next, we have the biomass, which we don't know, but I will be measuring that soon. So we'll just say unknown here. So we have our molecular weight of all of our components in grams per mole. Glucose is 180, 46 for alcohol and 44 for CO2. And then we need to break down each of these components into the elements that they're made up of. So glucose is six carbon atoms. So six times the molecular weight of carbon, which is 12 grams per mole, gives us 72 grams per mole of carbon atoms in the glucose molecule. And we can do this with the rest of the compounds. 
CO2, we don't have to look at the formula, it's not easy, <laughs> it's in the name. Next, we need to see what mass of each of these components we're getting. So first, on the right-hand side here, for alcohol, we know it's 2%, and alcohol is typically measured on a volume-by-volume -volume basis. This took me a while to figure out uh, a couple years ago, but it's not on a mass-per-mass mass or a mass-per-volume basis. It's volume-per-volume. Volume. So that means in our case, since we have 2 liters, 40 milliliters must have been alcohol. And then we need to multiply this by the density of alcohol, which is 0.79 grams per milliliter, in order to get an alcohol mass of 32 grams. This is a lot. Like, we added 63 grams of sugar and 32 grams of ethanol was produced. That's massive. But it really makes sense because this particular yeast is bred to produce alcohol. And even more so, this strain of yeast is made to be a high alcohol producing strain. It's a champagne yeast. It's the highest producer of alcohol for, you know, fermented beverages at least. So that's 32 grams of ethanol there. Then we can do CO2. And we have to do CO2 a little bit differently. Like I said in the beginning, one third of the carbon atoms from glucose will be converted to carbon dioxide. So first we need to get the molar amount of glucose that we get, which is uh, 63 grams times one mole for every 180 grams of glucose. And that gives us 0 0.35 moles of glucose. That's how much glucose we added in this two liter bottle. It's 0 0.35 moles. One third of this should be going to CO2. So for every one glucose molecule, we get one third of a molecule of CO2. You know, you can't get one third of molecules, but you know, that's how the numbers work out. So it'd, it'd be every three molecules of glucose, you get one molecule of CO2, right? So 0 0.117 moles of CO2. Using the molecular weight of CO2, we get five grams of carbon dioxide, which isn't very much. If you left your answer as alcohol being the main component that's being produced here, looks like you're right. There isn't much CO2 being produced. It's mainly all going to ethanol because this is an alcohol producing strain. Now we can break down each of these components in their constitutive elements. And we see we have 16 and a half grams of carbon, four grams of hydrogen and 11 grams of oxygen from ethanol. And the way that I did this is I took the molecular weight of each element divided it by the molecules molecular weight and then multiplied it by the mass that was produced because we know that 72 grams per mole comes from carbon we can do 72 grams per mole divided by the 180 grams per mole and that gives us the ratio of the mass of carbon in glucose and then we just multiply that by our mass, and we do that for every element. I did the same thing for CO2. And then finally, we can do our elemental balances. So we started with 25 grams of carbon from glucose, and we can subtract 16 and a half grams of carbon from alcohol and 1.4 grams of carbon from CO2, and we get seven, about seven grams of carbon potentially being used for biomass. We do the same with oxygen and hydrogen, and then we also add the two grams that we subtracted in the beginning from molasses. If we add all of those numbers together, we get a max dry yield of about 28 grams. So the most biomass that we could potentially produce is 28 grams. That's not bad. We have 63 grams of glucose that we're putting in and we're getting 28 grams of biomass out especially for a strain that wasn't selectively bred to produce a lot of biomass this is pretty fantastic so just to sort of wrap a couple of things up we expected 28 grams of biomass or at least a maximum of 28 grams of biomass from this whole fermentation process i took the cell debris that was at the bottom of that two liter bottle and dried it out in my dehydrator and I found that it's got about four grams of dried solid left in here. So cell debris was about four grams there. 
And then this is the final Marmite product, very sticky and dried out as much as I could dry it out at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And this I weighed on a scale and estimate to be about four grams as well. So total solids from the yeast, we got about eight grams and we expected about 28 grams. So either I did my math wrong, which if so, somebody please correct me in the comments below, or we lost about 20 grams of solid to something else that I didn't think about, some metabolic pathway or some volatile organic compound, something like that. So as a little fun side project, I wanted to see if the bottle would potentially burst with the amount of CO2 that we're producing here. So if you never opened the bottle, would the bottle rupture? So first we can just estimate the volume of gas that was produced using the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. P is pressure, V is volume, N is the moles of your substance, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is your temperature. We're gonna use atmospheres, liters, moles, and Kelvin here, because that's the easiest to work with in this scenario. The pressure we're working at is one atmosphere. We want to find the volume. We know the moles of CO2 that we're producing. We use this ideal gas constant and we'll use 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 degrees Kelvin as our temperature. And that gives us a volume of almost three liters. So from a two liter bottle, we're getting three liters of CO2 gas. That's a lot, that's a lot of gas. Next, we can look at calculating what pressure could potentially build up in the bottle. So for the volume, we can't use the volume of the whole bottle because the pressure is only happening in that small head bit space at the top of the bottle, the top 30 milliliters of the bottle or so. So I estimated 30 milliliters exist at the top of the bottle. That's the volume of gas in the bottle. We're trying to find the pressure. The moles of gas is different here because some of the gas is actually dissolved in the liquid. I looked up an engineering table and found that about three grams of CO2 can dissolve in two liters of water at 25 degrees Celsius. So I subtracted three grams from the original mass of CO2, converted it to moles, and that's what we get here. Use the same R value and the same temperature, and we get 38 atmospheres of pressure at the top of that bottle if you never opened it. So definitely open the bottle so that it doesn't burst because it definitely would. The maximum a soda bottle can handle is about seven atmospheres. Most soda bottles are packaged at about three and a half atmospheres. So the pressure created would have been 10 times greater than the normal pressure in soda bottles. So definitely make sure if you do this to crack your bottle open and make sure it doesn't rupture. I hope this video has been a good introductory guide to making yeast extract and maybe you learned something cool too. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. Bye.